Welcome, uh, everyone who is joining us virtually by Zoom to the Breckenridge, Breckenridge Memorial Lecture, Legislating in Polarized Times, presented uh, by the Socrates Project and the Department of Political Science with Dr. Sarah Binder. Um, and my name is Karen Bird. I'm a professor and chair of the Political Science Department at McMaster. Uh, I uh, welcome you and I want to I'll begin uh, with just a moment to recognize that we are meeting virtually on the traditional territory situated between the, uh, shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, which is acknowledged by the dish with one spoon wampum belt, which reminds us to um, share respectfully uh, in this territory and to take only uh, enough that we need. Um, and so let me move now uh, to a little bit about uh, the Breckenridge Memorial Lecture. Many of you who have joined us in our series of Trump Talks uh, through 2018 may have had the pleasure of meeting Dr. George Breckenridge, and we were saddened uh, by our friend and colleague's sudden passing in December 2018 which led us to cut short this series of public talks that he had founded and curated with the generous participation of the Socrates Project. George taught in our political science department from 1967 until his death in 2018. And uh, for some 10 years uh, since his official retirement, he continued to teach our US politics courses to the delight of many hundreds, indeed thousands of students. And he also engaged generous, generously with the media and the wider public uh, who have had a growing appetite for a deeper understanding of politics and the political dynamics in our neighbor to the south. George was a gifted speaker, a dedicated and inspiring teacher, and a fine and much valued colleague, and we miss him very much. And this memorial talk, be presented this evening by Sarah Binder, is our way of commemorating his life uh, and recognizing him as someone who inspired us to dig deeper into the intricacies um, of comparative political systems and to engage widely with the public in these explorations. And let me then um, introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Binder. So it's my profound pleasure to introduce Sarah, Sarah is a professor of political science at George Washington University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She's a leading scholar of US Congress and legislative politics. She's the author or co-author of seven books and many dozens of articles. Most recently, she's co-author of The Myth of Independence, How Congress Governs the Federal Reserve, which was awarded two major best book prizes her work has appeared in leading uh, scholarly journals, such as the American Political Science Review, Perspectives on Politics, and the American Journal of Political Science, among other leading outlets. She's also a regular contributor to the Washington Post Monkey Cage blog, uh, featuring uh, discussions on a variety of contemporary political issues. And finally, um, I'm pleased to say Sarah is also a friend our time uh, together goes back to our grad student days in the early 1990s, uh, lest I date ourselves too much, uh, at the <laughs> University of Minnesota. I had hoped to invite Sarah to visit us personally in Hamilton and to introduce you, uh, her to the McMaster community. Um, today, I'm so very pleased that she is able to uh, present her talk to us virtually uh, via Zoom. Welcome, Sarah. Great. And, Excellent. And thank you very much. So I'll, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. And thank you very much. Can you just make sure everyone can hear me? There was a comment in the chat about speaking up, but um, I assume we're good. Okay. Well, thanks very much for uh, including me and inviting me. I love hearing a little bit about George Breckenridge, and it's just a great uh, honor. I feel very honored to come to participate in this series uh, in, his, uh, in his memory. So I am going, let me just... Uh, pull this up and 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think of normally as legislating in polarized times, although clearly uh, we will also want to keep our focus on the challenges of legislating and what we might think of as COVID-19 uh, times. So I want to put three questions on the table for us, and we'll probably spend a little bit more time on the first question and then work our way uh, to bring it up to date with what we're seeing in the U.S. Congress uh, in response to the coronavirus uh, crisis. So first, I want us to really understand the question or the problem of why or how can we explain why the U.S. Congress typically struggles to legislate, particularly in recent years where we know that there are many big issues on the table, whether it's the environment, climate change, immigration, uh, entitlements, social welfare, many, many public issues on the table, and yet the ability of the U.S. Congress to actually tackle them um, seems quite limited. So I want us to think generally about the barriers to legislating in the contemporary Congress. But then I also want us to turn, when we're done, to think a little bit about how did Congress the President actually act quite swiftly, at least in the first, um, uh, first month of March, uh, last month, uh, act so swiftly to try to respond to these current health and economic crises. And then we can end up just speculating a bit based on uh, what we've been talking about, how long will this seemingly bipartisan cooperation um, last? So one thing I want to say before we get going uh, is that it, when I use the terms, I often use the term deadlock, stalemate, gridlock, um, but I don't want to suggest that we should only care about a Congress that can't um, produce solutions for an activist government. I think it's always important to keep in mind that you, you can't turn the ship of state to the left or to the right or in a, on a different dimension. You, you can't do that in the US without a functioning Congress. So it doesn't matter whether one favors liberal change or conservative change. We need to understand and try to have a functioning Congress in order uh, to move policy in either direction. Okay. So why does Congress tend to legislate so uh, with such difficulty? Um, I like to think of these as, well, today I'm calling them pathologies. Uh, sometimes I call them uh, dysfunctions. When I'm feeling a little more neutral, I just call them factors or forces. But there's sort of three deep issues or problems that Congress faces. And I want to lay each of them out because when we add them up, I think it helps to explain why sometimes Congress and the president can in fact solve problems and other times they just get mired in deadlock. So I'm going to take them each in turn, uh, electoral pathology, a partisan pathology, and then look at the rules of the game and how they might shape the ability and the difficulty uh, of legislating. And one thing to keep in mind when we look at each of these, th this electoral force, we'll see it really never changes. Right? So it, it can't help us explain why sometimes Congress um, can solve problems and sometimes it can't. It's like this bedrock constant. It's, it's with us all the time, and it's just helpful to understand the sort of baseline barrier that lawmakers seem always to face in trying to solve problems. The partisan variable we'll see will vary quite a bit, and then the rules of the game we'll see uh, interact with the level of partisanship to either make it easier or harder to legislate. So first, this electoral function. Uh, there is a political scientist, David Mayhew, who wrote a book in 1974, and he's probably had the single most impact on this one book that he wrote uh, that reminds us and he calls members of Congress single-minded seekers of re-election. Now, on the one hand, you think with sort of a cynical way of thinking about members, we might think, well, maybe that means they just care about getting reelected. And so they're always thinking about their own reelection rather than other forces and other the general good or the general welfare. But Mayhew meant something very specific when he called members single minded seekers of reelection. He meant that reelection was the lawmaker's proximate goal, right? It's what you bump into first before you can pursue any other goal. So you might be a pediatrician or a business person or a lawyer. You may have policy uh, views and goals that you might want to pursue that get you to run for Congress in the first place, but you can't pursue any of those other goals if you don't first get reelected. And so Mayhew warns us that, we, that, that lawmakers, that this electoral lens, it, they're always wearing those glasses. And it always colors how they're thinking about what the types of things they're voting on, what party leaders want them to do, and how they listen to voters back home. 
So one of the things, not only do we just have members who think in terms of their own reelection, but we also have often we think of voters as somewhat short-sighted, meaning they really care about the here and now. And we typically say that voters reward or punish members of Congress for the positions they take today, rather than the policy outcomes that may eventually result. And we're gonna to wanna to come back to that difference between positions and the outcomes when we come back to the crisis at the end, at the end of the talk. So why should we care about this electoral lens? Why does it help explain the difficulty of legislating? Well, this electoral glasses mean that lawmakers, they like to take credit for popular measures. They don't wanna vote for anything unpopular. In fact, they wanna avoid blame right, by uh, having to have their fingerprints on anything that could turn out to be unpopular. And of course, that constrains party leaders themselves. So members care utmost about their reputations back home, means they may sometimes vote for things that they personally are opposed to. Other times could be the opposite. They might, in fact, vote against things that they think, in fact, are good legislation. But so long as members are single-minded seekers of re-election, that's going to just raise the bar right out of the gate on getting members to be willing to cast votes for things that impose pain on constituents, right? Again, because reward or, voters reward the positions, the today, not necessarily what will result in, in the future. So we can come back to any of these factors. I just wanna put them up on the table as we're going here. Um, this will take a little bit of time to explain here. So we wanna move into what we think of or think of as these partisan pathologies. And here, what I want to do is to explain what I think we're probably many familiar with, this notion of the rise of partisan polarization in the U.S. Congress, and many people think amongst voters in the American public as well. So I'm going to show you some data, and it will make a lot of more sense in a moment. Uh, just bear with me as I kind of map things out for us. So if we wanted to know how polarized Congress is today, political scientists like to use uh, voting data. And all this is showing is a map of the House, an ideological map of the House in 2019 uh, when Democrats took back control of the chamber. So we can basically use voting behavior and we can churn them up into some sophisticated uh, calculations. And this is a system we call vote view. But what it does is it lays lawmakers out from left to right. So the Democrats here, the blue dots, populating the liberal flank, conservatives, the red dot, uh, populating uh, the right flank over here. There, there's a second dimension. Turn on my little pen here. Um, there is a second dimension here that goes up. We don't really need to worry about it. It's, it's just there so that the lines aren't like, the dots aren't sitting on top of each other so we can see them. So I think right off the bat, you notice that there really, that there is no body uh, in the center. It's empty. And so when we talk about political polarization or partisan polarization, that's the notion that we're talking about. That no matter the disagreement within the parties, right, those disagreements pale in comparison to how far apart uh, these parties are from each other. Okay, so we're gonna wanna figure out why does that make it so difficult to legislate? But the first thing we wanna do before we get there is to look not just at 2019, but we want to see what the trend has been over time. And keep in mind, this measure gives us little, we could add up to find the center of the Democratic Party and the center of the Republican Party in the House, and that gives us a distance. And then we can get the distance every Congress for the House and for the Senate for pretty much as long a period uh, as you'd like. So this is the distance between the parties from the late 19th century all the way uh, to the end here of uh, 2018. And one thing you'll notice here is obviously the rise in polarization and also the rise in polarization in both the House and the Senate, right? So oftentimes we think, well, the House, Congress is so polarized, the House is so polarized because of the ways in which lawmakers draw congressional district lines. Well, the Senate is polarizing too, but we don't draw, redraw the lines of the states. So there's some broader forces driving polarization. But for our purposes, we want to think about like, what is this and why does it make legislating so difficult? So sometimes we call this ideological polarization, right? That the two parties have very different views about the role of government, 
with Democrats tending to favor in recent years more activist government solutions, Republicans at least theoretically favoring solutions that have a much smaller government footprint or a stronger market footprint. But, and that's probably part of it. So if there's difficulty governing, some of that is explained by the two parties just wanting different things. But we see polarization, right? We see partisanship on issues that are not ideological, right? The parties will often, uh, Democrats will take one position and the Republicans will take the other position just because the other party has taken the other position. And we see that regardless of whether it's Democrats in the White House or Republicans in the White House, it's just rising levels of just team play. My team's for it, your team's against it. And that could have nothing to do with the underlying issue, right? Whether it's role of government issue or what have you. So uh, immigration, right? Uh, we have the parties taking opposite sides often, right? Even though in previous periods, they might've taken the opposite position. Or climate change. It's not really an ideological issue. It's a disagreement on whether it should be an issue or not, right? So the two parties disagree on those issues because they think their voters care about different issues. And so we end up with the two parties just typically unwilling to go to the bargaining table. And in fact, as we'll talk about in a moment, it's much more likely that they're asking themselves, like, what's the cost if I refuse to go to the bargaining table, right? Is, is there a cost that my party is going to pay if I don't participate, if I don't go to the bargaining table? And that arises because of the sheer nature of the rise of this partisanship, right? That the rewards are for saying no, right? Um, so we're going to, when we kind of come to the COVID crisis legislating, we want to kind of remember this issue about whether the parties pay a cost for refusing to solve problems. But as partisanship has gone up and polarization has gone up, we seems to be that the parties are much more likely to look to their base and ask, should we take half a loaf or should we hold out for, for a whole loaf of bread? And much more often the, the response is, hold off. Right? Wait until you control all of government rather than trying to deal with the other party. Now, add the backdrop to all this, of course, is we also have rising electoral competition, right? Much more frequent change in control of the White House, the House and the Senate than we would see back in this period here when there's much lower polarization. So lower polarization and less electoral competition. Today, high partisanship high electoral competition, and that increases the incentive, right, not, not to give in to the other side. Okay, so far so good. We have some electoral forces, we have partisan forces, and I just want to say a little bit about institutional pathologies or how the rules of the game complicate building of bipartisan majorities. I'm going to put aside for now the House, which looks quite different procedurally than the Senate, but the Senate, of, of course, is marked by the very many opportunities for individuals and small coalitions to block majorities from acting. And unless you have what we call cloture, unless you have 60 votes in order to cut off debate, nothing happens in the Senate. So we, it's helpful, I think, if we walk through an example to get a sense of how it is that the Senate rules interact with polarization to make it so hard to legislate. So if we lived in a world like this, right, lots of moderate, uh, moderate senators here, very few liberals, very few conservatives, to pass a bill you need the 51st senator to sign off, but to put the bill on the floor to cut off debate, you need the vote of the 60th senator. So imagine it's a bill, this is to pay, let's say, spend 50 billion uh, on, uh, natural park, national parks, and let's say this is a hundred billion. That's great penmanship here. Hundred billion on national parks. Well, let's say the fifty-first senator wanted seventy-five billion. Well, to get the sixtieth senator to join you, well, instead of fifty billion, sorry, instead of seventy-five, maybe you'd pare it back to seventy-three billion. And in that case, you might say, well, this filibuster rule requiring the sixtieth senator doesn't really harm much. In fact, it might be more better, a, a better solution because it moderates the bill. Now that might be true in a period of uh, moderation, but our Senate today doesn't look like that. It, it's this, right? Which is very many liberals over here, very many conservatives over here, 
And as we saw on the first map, like really nobody in the center. And then when we start to look at what the senators want, you're gonna to get to see why it's so difficult to legislate. So this is Lamar Alexander. He's literally the, what we call the median. He's the 51st senator. You need his vote to pass a bill. That's Elizabeth Warren anchoring, of course, the far left. Uh, Ted Cruz over here, uh, having grown his beard in this picture, anchoring the far right. But to pass a bill, it's not enough for the Republicans to put a bill on the floor and ask Lamar Alexander to vote for it. They also need the support of Tim Kaine, who of course was the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 2016. And he's not terribly conservative. In fact, he's on the liberal side. And so you could imagine putting a bill on the floor, but in order to cut off debate, to move to the bill, you need Tim Kaine to vote for it. And if Tim Kaine's gonna vote for it, he's probably gonna pick up at least 20 other Democrats. But if you pull a bill all the way over here to pick up the vote of the Democrats, oops, you're probably going to lose uh, Ted Cruz on the right. And if you're the Republican majority leader, you actually don't, in this world of high partisanship, you're often unwilling to legislate with Democratic votes if it's gonna cost you your far right. Now, of course, oftentimes we rely on the president, let's say a Republican president here, we rely on him to kind of set the path forward to give political cover to make it easier to vote for something. Of course, this president, doesn't stick on the right. Sometimes he shifts to the far left and sometimes he gets tugged way back again to the far right. And lawmakers know this. Lawmakers don't wanna cast a tough vote and then find themselves exposed, right? Again, remembering where we started that um, members don't uh, wanna vote for unpopular things. And this president has a much harder time uh, building any type of bipartisan consensus because he's such a polarizing figure. So add this all up, electoral, partisan institutional forces and you end up with this, this is just a measure of level of deadlock on big issues of the day. So a steadily rising grid from the 1940s here, all the way these data run through 2016. I'm having to come back to any of these uh, measures, but uh, up here, it does pose the question, I think, so how does Congress ever solve problems in a period of polarization? Right, given members electoral incentives not to get their fingerprints on anything controversial. Well, I think it's hope, helpful to keep in mind that, that policy choices and politics are always tightly intertwined, that, that members don't separate the policy from the politics. They are working together. And that means when party leaders are trying to decide, shall we go negotiate with the other party, they're always thinking not just about the policy at stake, but they're thinking about the politics. And in the period of high partisanship, as I mentioned before, the question is almost always, will we be blamed if Congress does nothing? And if so, when we had a, we had a five week government shutdown in 2019, and for most of that, Republicans who held the keys really because the president had decided he wanted to shut the government down over building a border wall, Republicans decided for a lot of that period they weren't going to be blamed. And so it turned into this messaging battle. Who was to blame for shutting down the government? And the Democrats really won the battle and the government opened up. And we see these messaging battles quite often. And so the question is always, is there a cost for refusing to negotiate? And if we're going to be blamed for stalemate, you're darn sure we're going to show up at the table. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about solving problems in polarized periods which is that the turf that Congress can use is it's not limited in any way, really, it's boundless. It means Congress doesn't just have to take a pie and divide it into pieces, right? It's not zero sum, right? You get three pieces, I can only have two pieces. It's really what we think of as positive sum. It's enlarging the pie, right? So immigration reform, when the Senate passed it a few years ago, uh, the Democrats wanted a path to citizenship for undocumented people in the country. Republicans wanted a lot of money for border security. Agriculture interests wanted a guest worker program. They didn't have to say, well, you could have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They enlarged the pie. Everybody got their most preferred outcome and gave up a little bit to the, to the other side. And that's why we often see that lawmakers and leaders sometimes legislate in the dark, meaning they go behind closed doors, which strikes us a bit as undemocratic. However, it gives them the opportunity to what we say 
put these basically in large pies together. And we often say nothing is agreed to until everything is agreed to, right? That they try not to have little pieces leak out because otherwise their base will get upset about the portions of things that you're giving away. And so we do see episodes where Congress, in fact, is able to make progress, but it often entails strongly empowering party leaders, legislating in the dark, behind closed doors, and often quickly so that even lawmakers don't fully grasp what's in the packages. Okay, which brings us to uh, the crisis legislating. And I would just say, we can come back to this in Q&A, of, of course, that this crisis really changed the cost of deadlock. Neither party wanted to be blamed for blocking any of those big measures that came up in the month of March, let alone the one that's going through Congress uh, this week. It was very leadership driven. It was literally <laughs> legislating in the dark. Uh, the Secretary Treasurer was going back and forth at one in the morning between the House and the Senate uh, and between the Democrats and the Republicans. And at the end of the day, the both the parties didn't really compromise all that much. They tend to get their most preferred outcomes. Republicans got aid to corporations, small businesses. Democrats insisted on paid sick leave, money for healthcare workers and hospitals, and so forth. So in some ways, I think the key issue here is that it looks like bipartisanship, right? It looks like the parties have sort of risen to the occasion to meet this pressing demand. But we should never forget, right, these members do, they never take off those electoral lenses and they never take off those party labels. And I think really what happened here is the parties understood they didn't want to be the ones to be blamed for blocking action, right, given how severe the economic context is here and the economic and let alone the health, uh, the health uh, crisis that we are facing. So how long does the cooperation last? Uh, I think what we're seeing a little bit already is that taking popular positions might not be enough. We know almost immediately whether these policies are working because we can see uh, people rising numbers of unemployed, we see rising caseloads, we see rising death counts. And in other words, it's just not enough. Like voters aren't gonna be pleased just by you taking a popular position. They're gonna care about the outcomes that's gonna affect them this early. Uh, every day. And I think that is going to keep the pressure on Congress to act, but we have elections approaching. We have two presidential campaigns that will have to adapt themselves to this world of uh, COVID. Uh, and that is always going to sharpen partisan lines. It's going to complicate legislating. And so in the end, pandemic politics, I think, could turn hyper-partisan and probably far more quickly um, than uh, is good for uh, solving, solving the problem. Now, I, I should say, I normally end on a uh, uh, cartoon about Congress and its legislative difficulties, but it, it seems so grim. Uh, so today, I thought in honor of <laughs> Earth Day, we would just uh, put the much more uh, hopeful <laughs> cartoon up there as the Earth uh, zooms with its um, <laughs> fellow planets. And on that note, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm happy to elaborate, answer any questions, uh, and so forth. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for a really uh, illuminating talk. Um, so just in terms of the format here, um, I will start off uh, with some follow-up questions for Sarah. Um, and, and we'll have a little bit of a Q&A between the two of us. And uh, I invite everybody in the, in the uh, online audience um, to type in your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then uh, we will move to, to um, I'll read those questions to Sarah so that she can answer them. Uh, so I'll, I'll start, I think, Sarah, um, by going back. Well, I, I, I think I want to put a bit of a Canadian lens on this and uh, and go back to institutions uh, because I think Canadians um, you know are are uh, fairly sensitive to uh, the differences between our institutions um, and uh, I guess I, I, I I'll maybe start by asking you um, how, to what extent are these pathologies that you outline uh, 
baked in to, um, to the fundamental rules. That is, to what extent is what we typically see uh, in terms of stalemate and deadlock in Congress, the intent of the constitutional founders. Um, and of course, I'm thinking specifically about the Madisonian system of separated institutions and a bicameral Congress um, that shares and competes for power um, as a way of limiting federal power. And of course, Canada has a bicameral system but a very different one than the u.s does because for all intents and purposes our appointed senate is highly deferential um and we're you know we're not uh both we, both we don't have that constitutional founding of uh uh this, this, this sort of principle of um limiting federal power um and and we have very different institutions there's a lot a lot of similarity, but very different institutions. So, so core question, I guess, is yeah, uh, how much of this is is was the intent of the of the founders, and so it's pretty fixed and you know not really going to change. And 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 how much is really this more stalemate and more problematic and more pathological than the founders ever intended? That's a great uh, great question. So let let's take it. Uh, each of these pathologies talk a little bit about these electoral forces and what the framers might have thought a little bit about parties and then about institutions and we can wrap it up. Um, I guess just just to start before we get into the separate forces, I think there's a sort of common notion in the US that the framers were all about preventing activist government right that they were all about constraining national power. Um, I think that probably doesn't quite do justice to the environment and the context, the political context in which they were writing the Constitution. They had a, a Congress, the Articles under the Articles of Confederation, and it was almost always stymied. It had a set of rules that really required unanimity, and there was no separation of powers, there was no separate executive. And what they found was this was a Constitution that really, really generated deadlock. And so, it is absolutely true that the framers wanted to make sure, that many of them wanted to make sure that there wasn't too much power given uh, to this new national government, but they were not out to stymie government altogether. They knew what governing looked like under such a system. And so I just thought we should always keep in mind here that if the system looks deadlocked, that's not necessarily uh, the intent of the framers. Um, I think many framers, Madison included for sure, um, was looking toward uh, a system that would be much more activist government and national level um, than, uh, than they had seen uh, in the early, uh, well writing, uh, just before writing the constitution. On, on elections and whether or not they would have seen this issue of members pursuing their electoral interest, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that we know from the Federalist Papers that Madison certainly understood that there was a problem of ambition, right? And there's a very famous line that we always quote about setting up the system to counteract members' ambition, lawmakers' and politicians' ambitions. And there was a sense in the, another famous line in the Federalist Papers where the idea was let's take these members whether it's the House members, the senators, or the presidents, and let's tie them to their, their place, their House, their Senate, and to the rules and responsibilities of these institutions. And that, the inference was, was going to help to sort of channel that ambition to like tie them and to stand up for their particular chamber or their particular branch of government. But Madison, the framers, they, I think that was just sort of hopeful, right? They didn't really create a system that would say, okay, you're a House member, you may eventually become a member of a party. There's no way to say that you're gonna represent the interests of the Congress, not the interests of your party, right? I think that was somewhat more hopeful than anything we see in the Constitution. So the idea that members would be ambitious and pursue their electoral interests, we see evidence of that very early in the Congress, voting for salary raises and then discovering that they've been thrown out of office. <laughs> members learn very quickly that it's difficult to give yourself a salary raise because voters would rebel. So on the electoral angle, I think it's fair to say, I don't think, uh, Madison would be confused about a lot of things. I don't think he'd be terribly surprised about that angle. 
having, of course, we've changed the way uh, we elect or appoint senators for sure. He'd be surprised about that. But on the electoral angle, I think there's some evidence to suggest that the framers uh, might have anticipated uh, what those electoral ambitions would look like. But the party, the, the framers certainly had no notion of, no, certainly no positive notion about parties. They thought that parties were bad. They thought they would create factions that would uh, tyrannize over smaller groups and individuals and over, uh, over the wealthy. So I think this degree, this notion, the emergence of this really strong national political party system, that's something they did not anticipate. And to some degree, that lies at the root of many of the difficulties that we see, which is, if you think about the lack, we often bemoan the lack of oversight. Like, why doesn't uh, the House, regardless of whether it's the President's Party or the Opposition Party, why, doesn't, why don't members stand up for the institution, right? Why don't they say, for example, right, there was the question of the border wall and the president decided to use a law that allowed him to kind of circumvent Congress's power of the purse, right? It's written into the Constitution. You can't spend without, the, without Congress um, writing a bill uh, to withdraw money from the Treasury. And yet the president found a way to get around the power of the purse. Republicans thought, by and large, thought it was fine, right? Democrats, by and large, were pretty upset. So what would Madison have thought? Well, I think he would have liked members' interests to be tied to the place, to their Senate obligations as the holder of the power of the purse, and to House members, regardless of party, right, to care mostly about the powers of the purse, right? That's how he thought the system would work best, right? Each chamber, each branch would protect its rights and its responsibilities, and so there'd be a counterbalancing of power so that no institution would become too powerful. I think Madison probably uh, would be quite uh, alarmed to see a system where Congress tends not to stand up for his powers, and as we've seen over time, given far more power to the executive. Um, just briefly on, on the institutional factor, uh, the, the framers knew that the Confederation Congress that they had was stymied, and one thing they made sure was to write right into that Constitution, Article 1, Section 5, um, the House and Senate shall write their own rules. Uh, they were quite clear. I think what was most important to them was that these chambers could design the ways of doing business in a way that they thought, the chambers thought would best serve their needs. Um, so uh, that, as we know, is developed in the, into the Senate in a way that really harms the rights of majority parties to, to work their will. That might surprise Madison, uh, but it would be at odds uh, with his desire and the other framers' desire to make sure that these institutions would grow and change over time as demands on them uh, evolved as well. Oops. Um, yeah, I gotta get in the habit of doing that. <laughs> um, I just uh, want to probe a couple of other potential pathologies, uh, particularly regarding the electoral uh, incentive and the electoral system, and 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 uh, get your thoughts about this. And and of course, part of this, I guess, is about thinking what has to change and what can change. Like, what should change and what is actually feasible to change. Um, and these may be non-changeable things. So one would be the enormous and unfettered role of money in, in campaign finance. Uh, is, is that it in any way playing a function uh, in polarization? Is it potentially something that can produce moderation? Um, and I think when you're talking about legislating in the dark, I assume a lot of that is about log rolling and uh, uh, you know, getting particular interests satisfied. So it seems to me that, um, that, that that sort of question about money and campaign finance maybe plays a role there too. Uh, so that's, that's yeah, that sort of a pathology. I mean, that, again, the Canadians would think that the role of money in US elections is, in, is a huge pathology, but does that translate into this kind of polarization? So that's a, a great question. Everybody's got an Achilles heel. Uh, and, and money, <laughs> and money is 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 mine. Money and money in Congress. I I think at the micro level, money does less harm 
than meets the eye. But at the macro level, when we step back and look at the amount of money that's in the system and the ways in which and the sources it comes from, that in fact could be quite uh, biasing uh, interests within within the system. So what do I mean by the micro level? It, it's it is it's difficult to disentangle the difference that money makes on individual votes or behavior or agendas. It's much more likely, it seems, from the most of the rigorous studies we have, that money follows votes and behavior and agenda and priorities rather than causing it. Right? That lobbyists and others, interest groups, will will reward members for positions taking rather than giving them money and then finding that members come around to the group's position. And so it, in that sense, there, I think at, at some level we need to recognize that members would be behaving in these ways even in the absence of the money that flows to reward those positions. And sometimes I think we don't give enough space to the fact that members aren't necessarily going to change their positions or pursue certain agendas just because money is dangled out there for them, right? Because members have lots of commitments, personal commitments, personal views, constituencies, local constituencies, national constituencies. Um, it, it's unusual, they stand out when members will do things for particular interests that aren't connected as well to interests in their district. So um, this just, the, I guess, a caveat when we look at these micro relationships we want to be a little careful in thinking that money really biases the type of behaviors that we and uh, choices that we see uh, lawmakers make. Um, on this other thing is important. I think uh, political scientists are still really working on it, the role of money in generating polarization in the first place. Um, I've seen evidence both ways. And the, the question here is on the nature of the donors. Who are these donors? Who are the bigger donors? Are they from the middle of the ideological spectrum? Are the donors themselves from the left and the right? Are the biggest donors on the left and right or the biggest donors in the middle? I've seen data all over the place. And we certainly know that small donors often tend to be from the left and the right, right? Because the party activists themselves tend to come from the left and the right. So I, I personally think my reading of it is that the jury's a little out on the role of money in terms of the degree of polarization. But the jury is not out on the question that, that money absorbs members' time, right? How much time members spend not in committee, not working with colleagues on problem solving or holding hearings or what have you. Most of that free time is spent across the street in these sort of campaign safe zones where they're dialing for dollars, right? And if time is an important commodity, which certainly it is, um, that certainly uh, biases the ways in which uh, members have less and less time uh, to spend uh, with others on committees or elsewhere, trying to figure out what the other side, what the other side really wants. So um, I'm gonna actually pick up a question that I, that I see in the Q&A. Um, follows, I think, from the direction that, that my question is going. Um, so why are moderates not getting elected? Um, and I guess the bigger question here, and I know you, you touched on some of this, but can you walk us through some of the forces of polarization um, in the general public and, and then how that gets uh, how that gets channeled into polarization uh, in Congress. Um, sure. So to, there's, think about, mod, I guess we'll start again with a caveat and then think about uh, why, why there seem to be so few moderates. When I put up the map of the polarization, right, where there's nobody uh, sitting in the middle of that house map, it's important to keep in mind that those are floor votes. And so in order for us to see moderates, there would have to be opportunities to vote on measures or amendments or bills that actually attract people from the other party, right? That map looks polarized because Democrats will vote for one thing and Republicans will vote against it and vice versa. And so long as the party leaders themselves and the, mo and the, the mass of the parties are from the left and from the right, in the House, if you're the majority, you don't have to put measures on the floor that will yield bipartisan outcomes. And so one issue here is that no matter if there are people who are moderates, and certainly 
right? We have some freshmen who come from districts that were run, 30 of them won by President Trump. So they're not necessarily really very liberal districts. They're probably more swing districts. Those members don't really have a, a chance, rarely have a chance to influence the nature of legislation. And so the rules of the game here amplify polarization, right? So even if moderates are elected, there's not a lot of opportunity for them to legislate like moderates. And that happens even in the Senate, even without such strict control of, of, the, of the rules of the game on the floor. So again, just a, a caveat, even if there are moderates elected, they really have a hard time getting their footprint made uh, on, on legislation. But why don't we see more moderates in Congress? Some of it has to do with just the nature, the activist nature of the, the base of the two parties, which is that the activists aren't coming from the, from the middle, right? Uh, the people who yell, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore, right? They're not moderates, They're, they tend to come almost by definition uh, from the left and, and from the right. And so if you are, uh, people who run for Congress tend to grow up within the party. They tend to be um, either active in the party or affiliate strongly with the party. And so if, if that's the source of people who run, they're probably gonna come increasingly from the left and from the right. Now, you gotta wonder then, when I showed you the, the rise in polarization, like why at mid-century, through up until maybe 1970s, 1980s, like you did have a, a big political center. Like, well, what does that mean? It meant that in the Democratic Party, you had liberals, moderates, Southern conservatives. And in the Republican Party, you had conservatives, moderates, and right, we don't even have the term anymore, right? Liberal Republicans. So you have ideological diversity in those parties. Where did that go? Like, why is it that the liberals sort of sorted themselves into the Democratic Party and the conservatives sorted themselves into the Republican Party so that we look polarized? Much of that is a story of the South. And it's a story of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, of the Civil Rights Act in 64, of essentially, eventually of conservatives deciding that if they're gonna get elected, they're gonna run into the Republican Party. So we see the birth of the Republican Party that begins to attract all those conservatives. And we, again, it helps us to sort into the parties. And if that's the underlying root here, that your competition uh, pushes you into the party, you're most likely to get elected in, you're not gonna see those uh, degree of ideological diversity that we used to see within both of the parties. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit, Sarah, and um, move to um, the kind of complex dance um, uh, of how, uh, how bipartisan agreement does get reached. Um, and I'll just, preface this with um, a little anecdote. I think many Canadians who live not too far from the US border who are of a certain age grew up uh, with Saturday morning cartoons interspersed with the little animated educational films, Schoolhouse Rocks, where we learned how a bill becomes a law in the US. Uh, it was a pretty simplified version. And I think, uh, you know, again, Canadians maybe uh, pride ourselves on knowing more about the US political system than Americans would ever know about the Canadian political system. But we surely do not know much about the, this kind of intricate way in which um, bipartisan coalitions do get formed. Um, so I wonder if, I mean, you, you sort of, you, you walked us through that a little bit with um, the, the kind of midnight runs uh, between houses that were done to get this you know, trillion dollar, many trillion dollar uh, aid package put together. Um, and in, in ordinary times, or maybe, you know, in, in other situations of crisis, um, there have been a few in the 21st, in this young 21st century, right, whether 9-11 or, or uh, the, uh, the global financial meltdown when they had to sew together some kind of coalition. Like, what is that, what is that like? And I guess you could provide us with sort of illustrations of how, how these kinds of um, packages are sewn together to actually get legislation passed when it needs to be. Um, 
Sure. So one thing to keep in mind is all the big, the sort of most salient issues um, that on which we see deadlock quite often, that's a very different experience or a very different outcome than we see for much less salient matters, right? So there is, people will, the counter story to whenever I give a talk about polarization, one of my colleagues will say, well, they do a lot of little things and the system seems to work well. Well, the system seems to work well on smaller regional bills, local bills, um, things that aren't on the left, right uh, ideological spectrum, right? Things tend to work because no one's really paying it attention. And so the parties have much less, the members have much less incentive to go to their home base. And we'll have some incentive to try to get things done. So we, we do see bipartisanship, but it tends to be um, out on issues where we don't, uh, much less national significance. So how do these things come together on um, major measures when they do come together? Um, I would point to first to keep in mind that not only as we've seen this rise in polarization, much of that has been amplified by party leaders. That is, as, as members of a majority party think more like and share more like with each other, they're much more willing to empower their leaders, right? Because they're not worried that leaders are gonna use the rules of the game against them to put a bill on the floor that's gonna be counter to their interests, much less likely to have that if the, if the parties are quite cohesive together. And granted, we do see cleavages on some issues, immigration and so forth within the parties, but by and large, we've seen a lot of centralization. So one model of bipartisanship here is really very leadership dominated. And on any of the big issues of the day, chances are it's the leaders in the room. And if it's not the majority leader and the minority leader or the speaker and the majority leader, let's say it's um, the government shutdown, it could be the appropriations chairs or the head of the big spending committees. But even when leaders are not technically, physically in the room, nothing happens without their sign off. So any negotiations are taking place first, it's much more likely to be a leader dominated um, deal than something bubbling up from, uh, from the rank and file members. We have some exceptions to that, we can come to them, but by and large, it's a very leadership dominated system. So one thing that's imperative in when these solutions come together, it goes back to this point I made the difference between dividing the pie and enlarging the pie. And to enlarge the pie, meaning for me to give you your top priority and for you to give my top priority, you have to know what the other side wants. And so people who study Congress, political scientists, we're not so good at ferreting that out because it, it doesn't leave a lot of footprints. Right? But it, it matters who's at the table. It matters whether they know each other, and it matters whether they've had experience in the room together negotiating deals. So you, you end up with sort of oftentimes these sort of odd fellow uh, pairings. Uh, Orrin Hatch, moderate, end of his career quite conservative, uh, with Ted Kennedy, um, very liberal, right? On issues of children's health, where the two had different interests, but they knew each other from their, from their years on the Health Education and uh, Labor uh, Committee. They knew what the other side wanted. And that is one of the sort of key glues to making sure these deals um, can come together. So we had a series of budget agreements, uh, 2013, 2015, another one, 2018, where the heads of the budget committees um, basically sequestered themselves with piped in from the leaders watching what they were doing. But before they sequestered themselves negotiating uh, was Patty Murray from uh, Washington State and uh, Paul Ryan from Wisconsin. They spent a little bit of time in each other's states. They watched a football game together. They had this remarkable comment. They were head of the budget committees. And I think as Ryan had said about Murray or vice versa, I barely knew her. I didn't know, really know who she was or what she was about. And so forging those connections, it's not a very political science -y thing because again, we can't measure it, we can't quantify it, but it, it seems to be at the root of a lot of these negotiations. So also add in closing the doors, right? Some space to make those types of enlarging the pie agreements, right? Because when they start to trickle out, 
uh, a, a, a base uh, party base will say, you gave away, uh, you're not going to, you're going to give away $30 billion for border security. How could you do that? They might say to Democratic leaders. Well, Democratic leaders want them to know they're also getting path, a path to citizenship. Right? So you, and you can't manage those expectations of the base back home if you're negotiating in the public. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, uh, as I said before, a little anti-sunshine, anti-democratic, but at the end of the day, it seems quite instrumental in creating the conditions under which lawmakers are able to extend those concessions uh, and opportunities to, to the other side. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it's really insightful. Um, so let's, a couple more questions for me and then we'll turn to uh, those that have accumulated in the Q&A. Um, let's talk about the tweeter in chief. Um, what is the role of the president and uh, the executive power in, in all of this? Um, now you mentioned that uh, uh, Trump is not uh, very effective at providing cover um, or at persuading, uh, I guess, members of Congress to, to, to uh, get his will done. Um, specifically, so generally what, yeah, what is, what is the role of the president in this in ideal circumstances? What is the role of Trump uh, in, in this today? And on legislative action on COVID-19, um, you know, is he going to come out to the extent that uh, agreement was forged and, and uh, stimulus checks are being mailed out to millions of people, apparently with Trump's name on them. Does this look good on him? And is 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 he is he going to serve him well, uh, or is 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 it you know understood that this was this was Congress's work? This was this had nothing to do with the president. The president was a fly in the ointment rather than any kind of uh, effective enabler of 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 a, a legislative solution. Hmm. So um, that's a good. Question. First, we could think in the uh, pre-COVID and then <laughs> the, the COVID uh, time. Um, it's been very difficult for this president to play the role that we've often come to expect of presidents, which is somebody to embrace that national interest, right? And it's not to say that pre a couple of double, double negatives here, right? Previous presidents, recent presidents have been perceived as partisan. But at times, they have at least tried to reach a broader audience, to reach beyond their base, to make a case for why a particular measure or package or bill is necessary. Um, President Trump doesn't seem to have that capacity or that interest or that discipline to take a position, to stick to a position, and then to use any type of uh, broad public support to encourage members who might be reluctant to take a tough vote, that he can't provide them political cover. And he really can't because he's stuck at 40%, sometimes earlier 38%, now 42, maybe 44, but, he, but, he, but he's um, stuck below 50% and he's stuck with a, with a core group of supporters um, and he's unable to attract anyone uh, from the middle of the political, really from the middle, of the political spectrum, if we look at independents who are also uh, waged, waged against him. That makes legislating difficult for all the, those electoral reasons we started with, which is members don't want to vote for unpopular things. And presidents have the capacity, if they can find a way to use their White House expertise or their bully pulpit, to try to craft a national message uh, that might make it easier for members to vote for things. And of course, in our system, with a 60 vote uh, threshold quite often in the Senate, that really does entail bipartisan majorities. And given how polarized so many people are over the president, it's really hard to see him playing that type of role. And a president doesn't need to be a policy expert, and he doesn't necessarily need to be an ideologue, but but members have to trust him, and they have to trust that when he stakes out a position, he's going to stay with the position. So whether it's um, regulating, tightening gun regulations in the wake of the Parkland uh, school shootings when he said we should have universal background checks and let's take on the NRA, well, 24 hours, 48 hours later, he'd switch his position. So if you were a cross-pressured member, a Republican from a moderate district who might want to embrace tightening gun laws, you didn't have the president within 48 hours, he'd already abandoned you. 
immigration reform on DACA, like how to deal with children who were brought here uh, as children, undocumented, um, who were then got into the DACA uh, protect, essentially protection program. At one point he's endorsing it and saying we should save it, and the next moment he's changed uh, all the way to the far right of the spectrum. So if, again, you're a cross-pressured member in that Republican majority in 2017 and 2018, you know there is strong support for doing something about immigration from your district, but the president wasn't going to provide you that type of support. So presidents can be quite uh, instrumental here. Will the reaction to COVID be, well, Congress did it and the president didn't? It's a little hard to know. We do know that Congress's approval ratings, so I think they've dipped a little again, but they went up 20 plus percent. I mean, it seems low, but historically, <laughs> quite high. <laughs> at least in the last 10 years, that's quite high. Uh, so those, Congress was getting, of course, when Congress acts, uh, often it does get uh, get better, better ratings. Um, so it's a little hard to know. I think at, at the end of the day, um, there's two possible outcomes. The sort of a normal retrospective accounting, right? Do voters hold the president accountable for the state of the economy and their own health and welfare? That's a dominant model that we have over the post-war period. That would suggest he'd quite be held to credit or blame for what happened. But men, people, voters are quite partisan. They have their own partisan blinders. And so we know that Republicans have been a little less worried about uh, the COVID crisis than Democrats have. And so uh, there's always this partisan perception that really makes it hard to know whether voters will really credit or blame, attribute those based on objective reality because they're, they don't see an objective reality. Everything is through those partisan glasses. Um, an, an interesting development I noted is uh, Trump has threatened to adjourn Congress, and, and, uh, which I understand is not actually a meeting uh virtually at this point um and i understood his argument is that he gets recess power to make appointments uh if congress takes long breaks so he just says well you're not meeting so you know i should have this power um so that's just us uh, actually a segue into uh what is congress doing uh and and is there i mean other parliaments have moved to virtual sittings uh, uh, we've been debating this in Canada this week uh, as to what, uh, how Parliament is going to function um, with a mix of in-person and virtual. Um, and am I, am I right that, con that Congress isn't, isn't actually meeting? There's some other kind of pro forma system going on? Maybe you could yeah, just, just talk, walk us through that. Sure. So um, neither chamber currently has any provisions for what we're now calling sort of e-Congress, right, electronic Congress, or remote voting, the capacity to set up your Zoom uh, and uh, vote on amendments and pass bills and so forth. That doesn't exist in the rules. There's no authority to do it. And in part, there seems to be a little stumbling block because the Constitution and House and Senate rules assume members are present. And what does that mean? Well, today's generation understand that present can be done technologically, right? That you and I are present, but I think there's an older generation uh, in the House that seems, and the Senate that seems quite resistant to the rethinking what does it mean uh, to, to assemble or, or to be present. And until they get over that stumbling block, uh, there's not been all that much progress in thinking about creating uh, remote voting. Uh, the Senate instead has been what we call, as you said, a pro forma session, which all that really means is that they come in every fourth day, they gavel in the local, who's ever the Virginia senator or Maryland senator who's ever nearby, gavels in if there's any messages to be received, and then they gavel out. They've been doing that for 10 plus years, and it's really to prevent presidents from it's sort of an agreement between the parties. We're always going to do this to prevent presidents from making recess appointments because the Supreme Court has said that those three days doesn't count under the Constitution as a recess appointment. So they come in every fourth day on the Senate side, and they had been doing that in the House. But Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker, called them back this week and because they're anticipating voting on this package that's coming to them uh, tomorrow on this sort of, we're calling it three point, COVID three point five, a small $500 billion deal. So the House is back, 
um, their thought there was going to be a incremental step on remote voting called proxy voting, which is if I'm a member from Maryland uh, and my buddy is a member from California, well, she can basically give me authority on the floor to vote for something as she as she directs. Um, Democrats who have been working about this in, uh, in really is sort of in secret. It uh, was released, saw it last night. Uh, Republicans were in the House were quite upset about it, uh, that they'd been excluded altogether and are worried about majorities abusing their ability um, to use this proxy voting. So the speaker backtracked. Uh, she took it off the table, it's supposed to be voted on tomorrow, so it won't happen. Um, she set up a task force, bipartisan, to try to think about the issues and whether it's possible to do them. Of course, she needs them, the House to come back in town in order to vote on them. So I think there's a bit of frustration because some members were back in town here this week uh, and didn't want to, um, don't want to have to come, they want to remote vote, many of them, rather than having to come back to change the rules or to create a system of remote voting. And over in the Senate, there's really been, there is support for it, uh, but not at the level of the leadership. Um, so uh, you hear conflicting, uh, conflicting accounts. I think the most strongest argument is that we require essential workers, businesses require essential workers to come back and to, and to work in dangerous conditions. And why can't lawmakers uh, come and actually do some oversight? Um, look at the programs they're creating sort of in live time uh, and consider whether there are uh, changes that, that need to be made. Um, but uh, that, if anything, probably, what we're in mid-April, we'll probably wait uh, easily until May before they're called back again. Uh, last theme that I want to uh, broach is, is federalism, another, another concept that Canadians are quite familiar with. Um, so beating the pandemic arguably requires intensive cooperation, not just between chambers at the national level, but across different levels of government. Um, and that typically requires subordination of um, political differences. Trump doesn't seem very interested in, in, in uh, trying to uh, broker compromise there either. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, what, so, and I have a question too on the Q&A, uh, you know, about the protest pressuring the governors uh, to open, to open up. So, so what, um, maybe, maybe just focus the question on, on uh, Trump, on the president, what are, what are, who are the key opponents at the state level? What resources do states have um, political or institutional resources to push forward with uh, an, an agenda that's, you know, arguably going to be more uh, helpful for public health than, than, than what the president might want? So states in here in the form of the governors for sure have a kind of a, a set of advantages on their side uh and then uh a certainly one disadvantage we can come to so first on their side constitutionally uh the constitution really reserves rights which are not enumerated they reserve them um, for the states and in this context that means that the states really have, under their, under their state laws, um, essentially control for public health, that they are the stewards of public health and the states have the authority to regulate on emergency basis and on uh, broader issues of, of public health. And that puts them in a position that uh, Trump does not have, uh, absent Congress legislating to create um, national level programs, say on national testing levels or what have you. It puts resources into the hands of governors, for sure, and legal authority. Um, they have authority over National Guard, right, and sort of the police forces, military, military force in, in the state, uh, so enable them to issue and then if they want in some form to enforce, right, the stay-at-home uh, orders. 
So in terms of constitutional and legal grounding, governors are on quite strong ground. And politically, they are largely on strong ground because voters, um, by and large, and I haven't studied all approval ratings for all 50 governors, but the ones who have been tackling the biggest problems here, um, California for sure, New York, New Jersey, uh, Illinois, have voters have rewarded them, right? If you ask voters what they're thinking about their governors, um, they're sky high in a system of, right? We have very contentious politics, but the governors are being rewarded uh, quite well. And in part it is because could be because of the crop and the background and the nature of these governors who come to those positions. Also the expectations voters have that governors will not be partisan, but they are there to solve problems. Uh, and they're there with their, literally their, their sleeves rolled up, communicating quite clearly, certainly in the case of uh, New York for sure. Um, so that, that's a political advantage to them there. If you look at public opinion polls, People are pleased with how the governors are responding. And by and large, despite the protests, um, that those protests seem to be a rather small microcosm, very small portion of most of these uh, broader publics. So politically, there is support for their positions as well. Now, normally what's working against them is the president has his enormous bully pulpit and he uses it every day at five or six o'clock. He is, schedules uh, a press conference that goes on for hours and gets most, not all, but most um, news outlets to, to cover live. And that's, that's hard uh, to counteract. Um, having said that, the messages that come out from the president's uh, press conferences are pretty mixed, even within a single conference. So uh, the, the, the megaphone the president could be using, um, it gets diluted along the way because he's on both sides of the issue, right? Uh, telling the governors to open up, liberate your states, and then telling Georgia today, well, oh, I would have told him not to. I didn't tell him to do that, right? So president doesn't want to be blamed. Uh, and uh, that is ultimately, I think, limiting his uh, willingness to try to bully the states into doing something uh, that they don't want to do. So I'm going to read some of the questions um, and uh, group some together. Um, so maybe still on presidents, how do, how do various recent presidents compare in their ability to deal with these polarities and to get their legislative agendas passed and implemented? Um, so I think it's a good comparison, and from uh, from my slide of ever rising levels of deadlock, um, the type of disagreements we see during the Trump administration that's not unique uh, to Trump. We saw high levels of deadlock under Obama, and high levels uh, rising uh, certainly the late 1990s under uh, Clinton as well as well as the late uh, Bush Bush years. So take. Uh, President Obama, when you have a large party majority controlling the House and the Senate, our system does tend to generate uh, big, big things. And so 2009 and 10, uh, certainly in terms of the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Wall Street uh, reform in the wake of the financial crisis, and a range of other issues in 2009 when Democrats were able to control uh, both both sides of the Capitol. Um, I would say we'd mark uh, Obama quite well in terms of uh, his ability to generate, help generate uh, major policy change. But the, his success after Democrats lost control first of the House and then of the Senate uh, was quite diminished. In, in part because of the strategy on the Republicans, which was they weren't really going to cooperate unless it really served their own particular interests. So um, we did see some major policy change in 2015, 2016, in a divided government with the Republican uh, House and Senate, uh, major infrastructure bill, transportation, renewal of an education law that had been stymied for almost a decade. Right? These were opportunities that Republicans wanted. They didn't want to be blamed for stalemate. They wanted to show they could govern in the prelude to running in 2016. And things got done. But those really required uh, this, this in, intense willingness to participate uh, on the part of, of their Republican opposition uh, at the time. 
Okay, there are, there are a number of questions on uh, the polarizing trend, and I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, do you foresee a decrease in this polarizing trend in Congress? And if so, what is the path to achieve it? And uh, the other one um, is, are there any upcoming leaders who can trend away from this partisanship, can help uh, move, that tr move that trend away from polarization? So this is always the, the question I get, and I have just um, kind of a, a glum answer, <laughs> which is I, I don't, I used to think that there was possible for a, sort of a, an issue would, a major salient issue would come that would separate and break up this sort of dominant uh, cleavage between the Democrats and the Republicans. And I thought for a while, perhaps it was immigration reform, that there was a much, uh, that at least in 2012, early 2013, when Republicans were thinking they needed to broaden their electorate to attract Latino voters, that perhaps that would ameliorate, either change the axis of competition or ameliorate the degrees of polarization. Um, but life just incrementally seems to be getting more and more partisan. And when we, when we do see divisions and cleavages within a party, on either the House or the Senate side, it tends to have the effect of blocking the issue from going forward, right? Not creating the formation of bipartisan coalitions. So the, the incentives to stick with your team are just so high that it's hard to see another issue coming in that would break those bonds, even on issues where we see disagreement uh, across or within a particular party. So I, I'm not very hopeful that in the short term, um, the types of changes that might yield uh, different alignments. I'm not really hopeful that that would happen. Um, are there upcoming leaders? It, it tends to be that the prominent politicians these days tend to come from the left and right, right, from for the, the base of their, their parties. And so absent right, presidential ambitions where they think they could, if, if they thought there's somebody in the middle, we might see these uh, emerging leaders move to the middle but with with voters increasingly polarized, it doesn't seem to be much incentive for an AOC on the left or uh, Josh Hawley on the right um, to to position themselves in the center. And and when they do, uh, when leaders or uh, emerging leaders do take positions that deviate from their party, it also seems that they get drawn pretty quickly back to core issues that got them elected uh, in the first place. And there are some questions, I think, on the um, sort of foundational sources of polarization in the public. So one question is, what is the role of the media in this? What is the role of social media specifically? And then a third uh, related question, if polarization is caused by politicians appealing to the public, what is creating the public opinion? In other words, what factors are causing Americans to have such polarized views in the first place? Um, those are great questions. Uh, you've tapped on like a whole field <laughs> of American uh, politics. If I if I was allowed to have a second Achilles, Achilles heel, it would be on my other on my other foot, and it wouldn't be anything having to do with the media uh, and and social media. Um, I, there's certainly a role of a polarizing role that media plays. And I think it's kind of complex and, and beyond anything I've really wrapped my head around, whether it has to do with the economics of the industry uh, and incentives within the industry and changes in the news industry. Um, but there's certainly a polarization of perceptions of the media on left and right lines, right? And we, we know that partisans tend to flock and to find I myself, right, find comfort in, <laughs> in different uh, sources of uh, the media. And we also know that re Republicans have driven a lot of distrust uh, in media that confounds the ability of even sort of middle of the road news organizations to try to play that fact, um, fact like that factual basis to bring a factual basis back to the coverage of politics, right? That if large portions distrust the media, it's hard to see the media playing that you know, mediating role. Um, the broader question on 
public, uh, a polarization within the public. There are a lot of folks working on this issue. And I think the most interesting explanations have to do uh, with looking at what we think of as the nationalization of politics, right? That if we looked at how people vote for a state lawmakers, state legislatures, over which we often, I myself don't know much about, it tends to be dominated by views about the president and about the economy, right? It's very na nationalization forces on how we look at local, local politics. But that extends far beyond politics, right? Uh, global brands, uh, national experiences, what is it like to be in Ohio versus what is it like to be in Kansas, right? The extent to which broad types of issues apply and get experienced by voters um, no matter their their particular social setting or political setting that the na that nationalizing of forces uh, and how issues are talked about may as well lead to what looks like polarization right that partisans Republicans in Kansas will hold similar views to Republicans in North Dakota and Republicans in South Carolina. So I, I think there's a phenomenon here, whether it's the source of news, the nature of news, uh, the nature of how parties uh, run campaigns that leads to um, this more uniform opinion uh, within the parties where we might have seen a lot of uh, disagreement or differences within parties uh, across states. But um, others are working on these issues. I think we still don't know really whether uh, elites uh, polarization causes mass polarization or whether it's somewhat of the other way around, right? Are lawmakers responding to polarized voters or do leaders send out very partisan messages and so voters are given a polarized choice and so voters look just as polarized as the leaders. Um, I think there's evidence on both sides, uh, inevitably, it's always a little bit of both, um, but others are kind of trying to think through some of those issues about this, the persistence of polarization and its spread, right? Another topic, Sarah, um, there's a question, uh, da, da, da. can you, uh, find it uh, about the electoral college. Can you please speak about the effect of the electoral college in presidential elections? Uh, <laughs> and you know, I guess yeah. And I, I would add to that. Um, you know, I, I sort of spoke uh, asked earlier about really what kinds of institutional changes are possible and what are impossible mm -hmm. during the United States. So the I think there are sort of at least two issues, current issues that get, uh, that arise over uh, the Electoral College. And one has to do with the question of, is, would there ever po be possible grounds for a third party, uh, independent party? Like, why is it that if there were to be a popular independent person who could uh, appeal to both parties, is there any chance that in fact that they could get elected president. And the ultimate stumbling block is the electoral college. And because it's not, a, you need a majority of, right? You need 270 electoral college votes, right? And to get a majority of the electoral college, it means you can't, you can't be a regional candidate. You can't just do well in Georgia. You can't just do well in the West. You can't just do well in the Northeast. You have to have in some form a, a, a national strategy and a national appeal to build that uh, majority of vote in electoral college. So that really biases the system toward one uh, the Democrat or the Republican candidate. And so long as there are two Democrat and Republican in the race, it's really almost uh, hard to fathom how somebody, unless they're going to run within the parties like uh, Mike Bloomberg did or Howard Schultz did or uh, Tom Steyer all on the Democratic side, or as Donald Trump did in 2016, um, one, and once you choose a party, uh, you get absorbed, right? The you get into the difficulties of how do you, who, who are the mechanics of, and the, the dynamics of who gets nominated within a party. So the electoral college matters here for um, basically uh, cementing a, our two party system. Even though if you ask voters, often they'll say a pox of both their houses, right? That they've turned off from both 
uh, from both parties. I think the other issue that arises is just the nature of uh, the fact that it's winner take all, that if you win, except for Nebraska and Maine, if you win the popular vote in the state, you are awarded all the electoral college uh, votes from that state. Um, but that's state law, not in the constitution. And so there is a discussion at times about what would it take for states to rally together uh, to change the way apportionment um, works. But uh, I would, I guess I would keep in mind, it's not always clear which party is gonna benefit from changing the allocation of uh, electoral college votes. But those two issues, impact on third party and the allocation of votes, seem to be the ways in which uh, electoral college gets talked about as well, of course, the, uh, a discussed, the general discussed with the electoral college generally, uh, and that we can produce uh, a president who wins uh, with obviously with the minority of the popular, without a without a national popular majority. Um, but doing away with electoral college, um, constitutional reform seems uh, even more out of reach than uh, most everything else. So we are probably stuck with that for sure. Okay, thanks for that. Um, can, can you speak a little bit about gerrymandering? Uh, this question asks, how can it be legal for a president to acknowledge that gerrymandering is a necessary tool to ensure the election of his party? And you mentioned gerrymandering earlier as one of the features and of the factors in polarization in the House. So I, I would say that I think the, the conventional wisdom about gerrymandering is not quite in sync with political science research findings for those who study gerrymandering. That is sort of the conscious drawing of district lines in a way that advantages one party or the other. And for the folks who do this type of research, they would say at best maybe 10, 15 rough percent of this polarization we see, sort of the creation of safe seats for one party versus the other party. Maybe some of that, a uh, small proportion of that has to do with the drawing of congressional district lines. But uh, again, right, we saw rising polarization in the Senate and there's no gerrymandering. So it's gonna give us pause. It's gonna ask, well, what else is changing that's driving um, Democrats into liberal, to be liberals to Democrats and conservatives into the Republican party. We, cert we have a sense of urban rural divides, right? Geography, right? I could do, you could let, give me a computer program to redistrict New York City or Berkeley, California, but I'm gonna have a really, really hard time coming up with a Republican, a seat that a Republican can win. So partisan geography may matter just as much, if not much more, than the ability of these map makers to draw very creative um, district, district lines, for sure. Um, there was a question about um, the US national debt. Why does neither party seem to care about the US national debt? I, I, I would invite you, Sarah, maybe to also talk a bit about the politics of central banking, um, given that you've written a book on um, the politics in the Federal Reserve and how, uh, and, and that's where the money is coming from for uh, the emergency stimulus and aid package in COVID-19. So that's a lot of debt. We have, a, we're, we're running up a lot of debt in, 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 in Canada in similar circumstances, but uh, so the question, what, why does neither party seem to care about the debt? So uh, I guess I would offer two, two reasons, although I'm sure there are many more, which is in part that uh, we call it Miles Law, where, where you stand depends on where you sit, right? Is it in your interest, right? What do you believe depends on your, uh, on your political position. Uh, of, of in your your place in, in government. So to some degree, the, the party that has said they cared most about debt and deficits were the Republicans uh, when they've been in the minority party. But when Republicans have been in the majority party and they have uh, seen the advantages of legislating away, let's say, tax, tax cuts, 
um, that generate deficits and higher levels of debt in the future, um, they've been perfectly happy to legislate in that way. And once in a while, Democrats will say some concern about, uh, once in a while, concern about debt, but it tends not to be when they're in the majority. So in a period here of the Trump administration and uh, the rising levels in uh, trillion dollar cost of the tax cuts plus uh, trillions of dollars on the COVID, um, to some degree we have Republicans who want government to solve the problem of the health crisis. And so it's in their interest uh, to be spending money, absolutely. So there's, there's a political angle here um, that gives neither side, a, side an incentive to talk about debt and deficits today. Um, second, uh, my co-author on uh, my uh, book about Congress and the Fed, Mark Spindell, keeps telling me, reminding me, money's free, right? That interest rates are so, so low that in such a time of crisis, it would be crazy not to be having the government um, spending all this money, right? Issuing debt in order to... Um, money in hospitals, money for healthcare, m money for wages, money for unemployment, right? Uh, the, the deep, deep economic recession uh, and worse that we're in um, just almost, it, it, it demands government action, demands federal government action, and at a cost just so, so, um, so low. Um, so uh, lots of forces here pushing lawmakers to spend now. Uh, and of course, keeping in mind where we started off the evening about members' electoral incentives who are rewarded today, and they like to push the costs to the future when they might be in office or they may not be in office, right? But the benefit is today, and they'll vote for the benefit today. The cost, they'll put off to future generations um, when they won't be held accountable for it. So we're coming close to, uh, to 8.30, uh, very close to 8.30. Um, and uh, I, I will just uh, give people a couple more minutes if there are further questions that they would like to ask. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you this one, which is, uh, there are a few versions of this, which asks you, Sarah, to, glaze, uh, to gaze into your crystal ball <laughs> and uh, tell us um, what is the likelihood of another four disastrous years of President <laughs> Trump. Uh, there's also a, a question here on what are the salient considerations that Joe Biden will, will uh, uh, be weighing in choosing a vice presidential uh, candidate nominee. So on, uh, on 2020, I, I, I stopped making predictions any type of predictions on November 8th, 2016. It was about nine o'clock at night, 9.15 at night. Um, so no predictions. <laughs> Everything we know, pre the predominant explanation of presidential elections is that they are a referendum on the president's performance and the president's typically seen generated by the state of the economy. Um, and by that model, given what the, the world we are in today, it's really, really hard to see the president get reelected. Having said that, we also know quite a bit about the intensity of partisanship, right? That some of my colleagues call sort of tribalism, like you just have those partisan blinders on. And if Republicans could find a way to put the axis, what's the axis of conflict on the, about, like what is this election about? This president is a master of reframing, of branding. If he can find a way to say things are worse without me or whatever it is to turn out voters in the handful of states that he needs, well, then we would say that this intensity of partisanship and the ways in which we view candidates um, could supersede the effect of a terrible economy. But we'll see, right? Uh, FDR got elected, re-elected, uh, and, and during the Great Depression, of course, things had improved. So we don't want to say never say never, but I would, I, I think that's what gives many people uh, some pause in trying to make predictions, this dis distinction between state of the economy, the objective reality of the economy versus our partisanship and how we, how we see the world. Uh, for Joe Biden, He's got to get out of the basement. <laughs> we just got to get him out of the 
basement, I think. Um, he seems to be setting up a process, as it were, for selecting a vice president. He's committed to a woman. Um, so I don't have any great insights into how that's going to work. There are a lot of names that come to the fore, uh, but he's going to, most of all, he, he needs to, if he wants his campaign to do well in these times where there can't really be a in-person campaign, uh, he's got to find a way to attract attention, right? In a way uh, to, to crystallize that there's a choice uh, come, come November. And, and uh, the question has popped in, any possibility that uh, presidential and congressional elections will be postponed because of COVID-19? So uh, I would be skeptical of the date of uh, federal elections is set in federal law. Um, I don't think we'd see a situation where Democrats and Republicans would be, would agree to change the date of the law. I think most of the attention on the Democratic side has been to push uh, for money for states to move toward uh, mail ballots or all mail elections. So um, I suspect come November, we will be voting. Uh, most people, or many people, I suspect, uh, newly discovering uh, the uh, use of the absentee ballots. Um, but we'll see. I think the, that election date is pretty entrenched in law and given stalemate, really hard. Uh, it's hard to see a coalition emerging to move that. Well, Sarah, let's um, uh, end it there. Uh, we have asked you lots of questions you've given us really illuminating answers. Um, so thank you very much for a lively discussion. Uh, wonderful Excellent. to have you join us. Thanks for having me. I will just uh, make a brief um, announcement that uh, the next Socrates webinar will be held on May 6th uh, entitled Why We Need the Arts More Than Ever. And it features Globe and Mail journalists Kate Taylor and Simon Hope. And uh, these webinars uh, are being recorded and posted on the Socrates Project YouTube channel. So uh, you can, if you can't make a specific date, you can view them later. Uh, so I hope you can join us on May 6th. Um, and thank you again, Sarah, thank you uh, to the Socrates Project for hosting this. Please, everyone stay healthy and safe as we continue to navigate uh, these challenging times. Stay excellent. well. Thank, thank you so much for all the excellent questions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Good night. Sure. Yep. Good night.